It was the spring of 1946, one month before Easter, and the pastor told his little country church of about 80 people, he said, I want all of you to begin to prepare in one month from today. We're going to all bring a sacrificial offering on Easter Sunday. So the church went into motion, and there was a family there that was a mother. She was a mother of seven. The older four had uh, already left home. Dad had died five years earlier. So there's a boy and two girls, 12 and 16, uh, 14, uh, 12, 16, and 14, and it's left in the house. So they got together and they said, the pastor said, we're going to raise a sacrificial offering. It's 1946, and um, they were uh, very poor. But they said, we want to partake in this sacrificial offering. And so they decided to take as many odd jobs. You know, they would cut grass and they would babysit for 15 cents. And um, they bought a pound of cotton and actually made pot holders and sold them for um, a few cents a piece and actually raised about $20 selling pot holders. Um, they decided if we, if we turn the lights down and don't use the electricity, uh, you know, we could save some money there. And if we don't listen to the radio, we could save some money there. And they decided to buy 50 pounds of potatoes to start that month off so that they could trim $20 off of their grocery bill and just eat potatoes, all to give in the Easter sacrificial offering. So Easter Sunday morning came, and they prepared to receive the collection, and they were so proud. Uh, they had raised $87. $87 in 1946 was a lot of money. And the mother had her ones, and then each of the kids had a 20, and they, they put it in that offering, and they were proud as peacocks, man. Not, not proud in a bad way, but they were proud that they had done something for the work of the Lord and the pastor made the statement that this is going to go a long way to help a family that is in trouble. Later that evening or the next day, the pastor showed up at their door, knocked on the door, had a card, an envelope, and uh, he said, as your church, we'd like to present you this, this card and this love offering he knew that they were poor. They didn't know that they were poor. And they, they were so taken back by it. They said, we felt like millionaires when we, when we gave the money, when we sacrificed it. We, we felt so good about ourselves. And now to find out that we're really poor. They held on to the money, kept it in an envelope, didn't do anything. The next Sunday, a missionary was visiting the church and he preached. And he was, I can't remember the nation, but he was trying to complete a church. They were $100 short of doing that. And um, they received the offering that day, and Mom looked at the kids, and they all nodded together, and they took that envelope out of Mom's purse and laid that envelope in the offering plate. That day, of 80 people in the church, they took up a little over $100 and 87 came from one of the poorest families in the whole place. People tell me sometimes, Pastor, you just don't know my position. You just, you know, if I, if I was where I, if I was where that person is, man, I would be, no, 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 no. You see, money only makes us more of what we are. If we're a jerk right now, we're going to be a super jerk when we get rich. You know, you know what I'm saying? If we're generous right now when we get, have a $10 allowance, we're going to be super generous when we have a $100 allowance. It just only, it magnifies what we are. I want to thank you for your giving church, a giving church. You have given sacrificially again and again and again. And you know what we have done in turn? We have helped so many people. I can't tell you the people that have called us during this COVID-19 deal. And we do it all the time, but, but it seemed to have ramped up. Not only uh, in our community, but, but I've had evangelists call me and say, you know what? Hadn't preached a revival in 10 weeks. Is there any way you can help us? And because of your giving, we was able to say, we absolutely can. Thank you for your giving. You're making a difference in the kingdom of God. I want to pray, if I may, over your finances right now. I don't know about you, but I believe God it, it should be in the place to order my finances, not me. 
You know what I'm saying? What money I have, what holdings I have, all of that, it really ain't mine. It's his. It's at his disposal. I'm just sort of managing it. And if he says, put a little over here, put a little over there, do this, do that. Even when he has said sometimes to put something that I look and say, well, Lord, I don't even know where that's going to come from. He said, you just go ahead and make the commitment. I'll make sure it's there. And somehow he always does. And I don't, I, I, I'm not telling nobody to go put something on your credit card because I, I tell but don't pay your tithe on your credit cards. Man, you borrowing money. To, don't do that. Obey the Lord with the first fruits. And I believe God will make all grace to abound to you. Father, we love you. I thank you now. I ask you, God, to touch your people today. <clears throat> I pray, Lord, that you would minister to them. God, that you would open the windows of heaven and pour them out a blessing. There's not even room enough to receive. And I thank you, Lord, for it and for what you're going to do. In the name of Jesus. Listen, we've got a number of ways you can give today. I know our ushers are not serving as they have in the past because of this COVID-19 and all the stuff that's going on with that. But, but listen, harborwc.com forward slash give. You can, do, you can give however you like there. You can also text to give. I love text to give. It just makes it so easy. I store the number in there just like a contact. And when I get ready to give, I just click on that contact and boom, I can, I can pay my tithe or offering or whatever it is there. So, so thank you for however you do it. Also, the kiosks are available in the foyer uh, as well for your giving. And, and uh, let me just say this. Had it not been for the platforms that we had put in place through kiosks, through text to give, through online giving and various other things, man, we'd have really been in trouble when COVID-19 hit. But I thank God for your willingness to step up and learn the technology. Uh, and I'm not knocking paper checks. Hey, if you want to pay the church off with a paper check, we're glad to help you out. We'll take it. We'll do everything we can. But uh, anyway, let me just say thank you for, for uh, your faithfulness. And God's doing some amazing things. I can't wait to talk to you about our miracle boards. Man, we have a service and just as soon as we can get back in the house. But right now, help, help me pray for our country that this, this COVID pandemic would subside. And uh, just for the entire chaos that's in our country uh, right now. So God bless you. Let me reiterate what Chelsea and Dwayne said a moment ago about our cross meetings and our diversity board. I've got an honor of hosting our entire committee at my house tonight. Y'all pray for me. Uh, anyway, uh, we got about, uh, I don't know, I think it's about 20 uh, when you count children and whatever, but we're going to have a good time tonight uh, talking uh, social diversity, and we've really created a bond uh, among this team, and we're just excited about that and what God's going to do with it. And I welcome you as well to Summer at the Harbor. And um, man, it's going to be a great time. I'm looking forward to some, some special things. Obviously, the, the uh, 4th of July was well, actually not the 4th of July, but it's part in the USA Wednesday night. I think that's the first. Man, that's going to be a great time. And then um, the, the following first Wednesday, we have Pastor George Moxley will be speaking for us. We had him scheduled early, and we had to cancel five speakers, not just first Wednesday, but some Sunday morning guys too. And we had some renowned speakers, not that anybody's any better than anybody else. I'm just simply saying some well-known throughout the country that were slated to be here, but because of COVID, ended up having to cancel. But we're going to try to get them all rebooked in here. We've got some special things. Reggie Dabbs is coming back, I think, next month sometime. Um, Tony Suarez is coming later uh, this year. So we got some great things in store for you. But let me jump in right now to say Summer at the Harbor, uh, and I want to talk to you today, God helping me, um, about, uh, you know how Jesus told stories? Uh, in fact, I opened this offering with this, this true story of this family back in 1946. <clears throat> well, Jesus tells us a story in Mark chapter 12. <clears throat> and it's a story about some bad farmers, some evil farmers that, um, that didn't do what they should do. And I want to read that. And then I, if God would help me, I want to, to share a thought with you today or a message with you today entitled Love's Last Appeal. In other words, <clears throat> love's final, final appeal to its people. 
And, and it'll become clear as we go, but <clears throat> let me share with you the story out of Mark chapter 12. Jesus began teaching them by stories, and he said, a man planted a vineyard. He built a wall around that. He dug a pit for the pressing of the grapes, uh, the grape juice, and he built a lookout tower. Then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and moved to a far country. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent some, one of his servants to collect some of his share of the crop. But the farmers grabbed this servant, they beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. The owner sent another servant, but him they insulted and beat him over his head. The next servant he sent was killed. Others he sent, and they were either beaten or killed. Until finally, he, uh, there was only one servant left, and his son, whom he dearly loved. The owner finally sent him thinking, thinking, surely they will reverence my son. Verse 7 says, But the tenant farmers said to one another, Here comes the heir to the estate. Come and let us kill him, and we'll have the estate for ourselves. And so they grabbed him and murdered him and threw his body out of the vineyard. What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do? Jesus asked. I tell you, he will come and kill those farmers and lease the vineyards to others. Did you ever read the scriptures? He says in verse uh, 11 or 10, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and is wonderful to see. So let, let's break that down, if I may. The story of the evil farmers, or some have called it the story of the vineyard. And there's another one, though, that, <clears throat> that, that has that same connotation. So let's just think about these evil farmers. First of all, he planted a vineyard, and the Bible says, with the choicest vine. It wasn't some secondary seed. He planted it with the best seed that he could find. He built a wall around it to protect it. The Bible says that he dug a pit for the wine press. In other words, he hewed that pit out of the rock that was nearby so the grapes could be poured into this pit and they would press the grapes and the juice would run out. So he built a wall for protection and he dug a wine press that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard. He built a lookout tower for further protection where one could watch for fire that got started, for animals that would come to eat up the grapes, for thieves that would break in and steal the grapes. And then after having done all of that, he leased it out. <clears throat> he leased it out, his vineyard to other farmers so that they might come and work the land. And he moved to another country. Keep in mind that the owner of the vineyard was entitled to receive a portion of the vineyard's production. It's part of the deal. It's part of the lease. He's the owner of the land. They were tenant farmers. At harvest time, he sent one of his servants to collect or to, to get his share of, uh, of the vineyard. But the farmers grabbed him and they beat him and sent him away empty-handed. The owner thinking, that surely they just don't understand. You've probably had things happen before where you, you were just so befuddled, you said, they, they just don't understand. And, and you just immediately sent someone else, or you immediately called again, or whatever. And so uh, he sends another, and him they insulted and beat him in the head sending him home empty as well. The owner says, they surely don't understand. He sends another servant to get what's rightfully his, a portion of the fruit of the farm. And this one they killed. And the Bible says he sent many others, some they beat and some they killed, 
till he only had one left, and that was his own son, and that was Jesus, really, and I'm going to break that down for you in just a moment. And he said, surely they're going to reverence my son. But they grabbed him, <clears throat> murdered him. Now, there is a play right there because Jesus tells us no one took his life, but he laid it down. But understand what Jesus is telling in this narrative. He's telling this story. He said, they took him and killed him and threw him outside the vineyard. What a sheer autobiography of his own life. It made the people so mad because the people he were talking to knew that they were plotting to do the same thing against him, and he was heir. He was the one who had come, but the Bible said he come to his own, and his own would not receive him. So he, let me give you the meaning of the story, and, and, and many of you probably know it, and I don't mean to insult you by by, by trying to enlighten you, but nonetheless, if you don't, the man that planted that vineyard is God himself. The man who planted it, it, it's God. Israel is symbolized by the vineyard. The tenant farmers represent Israel's leaders. Harvest time for a vineyard could be as long as five years. It wasn't that you just left you know, in, after the spring and come back when it comes time to harvest. No, it, it, usually it took up to three to five years and they would come back. <clears throat> but, but the mistreated servants represent the prophets that God had sent, continuously sent, and they would beat this prophet. They would imprison this one. They would stone this one. They would tear this one asunder or drag him with horses. And again and again, God would send a prophet beating some and killing some. And finally, God said, I love these people so much that I will send my only son. They will reverence him. Because he's not like anyone else. He's my son. And him they killed. Romans 5 and 8 says, God commended his love toward us that while we were yet steeped in sin, Christ died for the ungodly. No greater love has any man for his neighbor than that he would lay down his life for him. And Jesus said, I give my life so you could have abundant life. In the garden, he prayed to his father and said, is there any other way? If there's another way, let this bitter cup pass from me. Nevertheless, if there's not, I'm willing to drink it. And that's what he did for you and me. But here's an appeal from God. God is telling Israel. God is reaching to his own people. He's sending a prophet. And he's sending another servant. And another servant begging them to hear him. They don't hear him. So then the story goes on. He says, what do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do? I tell you what he will do. He will come and kill those farmers and take the vineyard from them. Let me read to you the story from the book of Isaiah. It's amazing the parallel from Mark chapter 12 all the way back a few thousand years to Isaiah chapter 5. Verse 1. Now I will sing a song for the one I love about his vineyard. My beloved has a vineyard in a very rich and fertile hill. He plowed the land, he cleared its stones, and he planted the best vines. In the middle, he built a watchtower and he carved a wine press in the nearby rocks. He waited for the harvest of sweet grapes, but the grapes that grew were bitter. Now you people of Jerusalem and Judah, Judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard that I have not already done when I expected it to bring forth sweet grapes? Why did my vineyard bring forth bitter grapes? Now let me tell you what I'll do to my vineyard. I will tear down its hedges and let it be destroyed. 
I'll break down its walls and let the animals trample it. I will make it a wild place where vines are not pruned and the ground is not hoed. A place overgrown with briars and thorns and I'll command the clouds to rain no rain upon it. The nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heaven's armies. The people of Judah are his pleasant garden. He expected a crop of justice, but instead he found oppression. He expected to find righteousness, but instead he hears cries of violence. Let me share something with you. Did you realize that in, in all of the other stories that Jesus told, in all of the other analogies, he always gave a way out. In other words, you remember, um, e even in the prayer for Solomon, he said, when he answered and said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. He always, when he told a story like this, he always gave a caveat. He gave some sort of, but if you change and do this, if you repent, then I will relent of my anger, etc. Even when he sent Jonah to the nation of Nineveh, that great capital of Assyria, he says, yet 40 days and God will rain fire and brimstone down on this place and destroy it. However, the people turned their face to God. They fell on their face and they wept and they fasted and they prayed and God relented of the plans to destroy the place. In this oracle, we find no such caveat. There is no other way. He says, I tell you now what I will do to my vineyard. I will come down and take away the tower that I built that looks out for protection of fire and thieves and enemies and marauders and all of that. I'll tear down the fence that protects this vineyard. I'll strip it down to the ground and I'll command the clouds not to rain upon it. And basically it'll become a byword. He gave no other caveat. You know why? It was his last appeal. He had sent servant after servant and prophet after prophet and they had killed and maimed and bruised and rejected the Lord of heaven and he said, now, surely, they'll accept my son. He said, but I sent the best that heaven had, and you didn't want him. So there is no other choice. You can have him. You can accept him, but there's no other option. It's Jesus or nothing. He said, I looked for justice but found oppression. He said, I looked for, for good fruit, for sweet grapes, but I found bitter. Now, I want to ask you a question. What happens when the Lord, what do you suppose the Lord of the vineyard must do? You see, what should he choose to do to us who are God's people? When he looks at us time and time again and he's given us the best word that money can buy, the best seed that money can buy. He, well, money really can't buy it, but it is the word of God, the seed corn that he's given us. We've got every reason to become a rich and I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about money, but rich in God, rich in the Word of God, uh, a, a, stud, a, a student that has learned the Word. We, he's given us everything. My God, He's given us. The, look at the facilities we've got. Look at the property we've got. Look at the technology we've got. Look at the AC and the cushion seats and all of this stuff we've got. What could have been done more in my vineyard that I've not done, God says. But I look to see sweet grapes and sometimes, I, I want to tell you something. In some churches, I have to say, not all, some of the most malicious talk right now, in the, and, and, and our country's in a mess, man. I'm I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican, our country's in a mess. And the Democrats can't fix it, and, and Republicans can't fix it. I believe the church is going to have to step up. I think only God can fix it. So, Jesus says, I'm going to come and I'll kill those farmers and lease my vineyard to someone else. What God is saying, listen, if we are the people of God, 
And those tenant farmers were the leaders. If we don't do God's bidding, I'm going to tell you something. Now is a tough time to be a leader. You know what James said? You be careful how many of you aspire to be a leader or a teacher. He said, because you're going to receive the heavier judgment. You know something? We can't just put a flag up in there and find out which way the wind's blowing. In other words, what does everybody want to hear and, and talk that way? I have to look into the Word of God and say, this is what God said, and it doesn't matter if it pleases them, if they like it, if they don't like it, that we're not to preach for the approval of men, but to preach for the approval of God. And it doesn't matter what race, color, or creed we are. Are you with me? Say amen. Amen. I think, oh my Lord. Let let me tell you what happened. I I didn't realize this, but um, I've read the scripture for years, but all of a sudden it it dawned on me in Isaiah chapter five, the, the prophet went on to speak six woes that was coming upon them and the reasons why. He said, here's the problem. He said, this comes as a result of bitter grapes. In other words, you know what the Bible says? If you sow to the wind, you will reap the whirlwind. Do you know, I don't care who you are, where you are, and, and what venue you put this, you always reap what you sow. If you sow bad words, you're gonna reap bad talk. If you sow a bad attitude, you're going to reap that. If you sow money, you're going to reap money. If you sow love, you're going to reap love. If you sow kindness, you're, you, a farmer don't plant beans and get watermelons. It don't happen that way. So if you're lacking something, let me ask you, why don't you start planting what you're lacking and then you'll have an abundance of it. But later in, I, I don't know if I have time to read it all, but He said to the people, he says, this is coming as a result of the bitter harvest, the bitter grapes, the crop that was harvested after the owner planted the very best and the vineyard had every opportunity to produce the best. The first woe, he said, it's directed to those in the vineyard that was, they were buying up all of the real estate. These were the more affluent he, but, but they were taking up all of the real estate. And, and God says, I have given this land. And there was plenty and everybody could have had some, but there's you know, just a three or four that has just really hoarded it all up. You remember Naboth uh, when he tried to take, I mean, excuse me, not Naboth, when the king tried to take Naboth's vineyard? That, that, that's, it's very simple. It was very similar to that. And then he says the second woe is directed toward those. So in other words, he was aggravated with those who were just taking up all the land. And then the second one, he says he's aggravated, and this struck me. In fact, I put a post about this earlier in the week when I was studying. You may or may not like it, but here it goes. (laughs) The woe is directed toward those who indulge in excessive drinking of alcoholic beverages. He said in Isaiah 5 and 11, catch this. He says, what sorrow for those who get up early in the morning looking for a drink of alcohol to spend long evenings drinking wine to make themselves flaming drunk. They furnish wine and lovely music at their grand parties, the lyre and the harp and the tambourine, the flute, but they never think about the Lord or notice what he's doing. Wow. He said, Pastor, that's pretty hard. I didn't write it. I'm just, I'm just relaying the message. You know, it, If we never think about him, something's wrong. The third woe, he says, it begins by picturing people whose sins are so heavy, they need a cart, a wagon to pull behind them. Are you with me? And then the fourth, he says, is those who are confused. uh, uh, The fourth woe is against those who confused ethical categories. In other words, and we've reached this place, they called evil good and good evil. They they take something that is a clear violation of Scripture and say, that's all right. And something that's okay and encouraged in Scripture, and they say, that's wrong. If we don't live in a society like that, so help you. Calling evil good and good evil. The sixth and final woe He says, returns to an earlier issue of excessive drinking again and twisting justice 
for money. You know what God hates? Seven things God hates, but one of them is lying lips. And it doesn't matter if you lied about taking a gym clip or lied on your taxes. Lying lips are an abomination unto the Lord. Brothers and sisters, all we have in this world is our word. Our word, that's it. It's our bond. So let me close like this. There are those who know the way. They, they know the way. Then there are those who go the way. There are those also who will show the way. Let, let me explain some of that. For those who know the way. Who do men say that I am? Jesus asked. Who do men say I am? When he came to Caesarea Philippi, he asked Peter. He said, Peter, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And he said, well, some say thou art Elijah or Isaiah. So one of the prophets, John the Baptist. But he looked at him and said, no, 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 no. I'm not asking you who they say I am. I'm asking you, who do you say I am? And he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, Simon Barjona, Simon, son of Jonah, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom of God. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. You'll tread on serpents and scorpions. Nothing's going to hurt you. There are those who know the way. Furthermore, um, there are those who go the way. James 4 and 17 Oh, that other, the scripture there in John 13, 17, he said, now that you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Now that you know the way, happy are you if you do them. It's one thing to know the truth and another thing to live it. James 4 and 17 said this, to him who knows to do good and don't do it, it's sin. You see, there are those who know the way, and then there are those who will go in that way. There, but there are some people, they know the way, but they just don't have the guts to go there. Sometimes it, because it's peer pressure, somebody's watching. Sometimes they just can't let go of other things. It's almost like Herod Agrippa when Paul talked to him about the Lord, and he reasoned of righteousness and temperance of things to come. And he said, Paul, almost, Thou hast persuaded me to become a Christian. And then there are those who will show the way. Matthew said, in the same way, let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good deeds and glorify your Father that's in heaven. And so you got, you got those who know the way, those who go the way, those who show the way, and then you've got Jesus who is the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is in him that we live and move and have our being. I want you to understand as God planted the very best seed I speak of Israel as far as the vine, but, but now I broaden that because not only did the gospel go to Israel because of that rejection, it went to the Gentiles, which are you and I. What could have been done more in my vineyard, in my church, among my people, that I, the Lord of the vineyard, have not already done? What could I have given you more? It reminds me of what he asked David. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, you remember what he said? He said, David, I had given you luxury and I'd give you money. I gave you power and pomp and circumstance. I gave you all this. And if that hadn't been enough, I would have given you more. But now look what you've done. You've gone and taken what was not yours. This is love's last appeal. He said, I've sent prophet after prophet and they've beat some and they've killed some and wounded them and shamefully treated them. 
And God said, the last deal was this. And the final great appeal, as you stand with me, was I'll send my son to hang between heaven and earth to become the propitiation for your sin, the sacrifice. You deserve to die. I deserve to die. And if we'll be honest with ourselves right now, if we're not where we ought to be with God, it's not the master's fault. It's not God's fault. It's not the keeper of the, I mean, the, the owner of the vineyard. It's not his fault. It's not that the word of God was subpar or substandard. No. It's not that there was anything wrong with the servants that came and preached and taught and lived a life of example. But the greatest place we'll ever get in our walk with God is we can look in the mirror and say, I am the reason today that I am not where I want to be. Because for whatever reason, I chose to either ignore the Word of God, disobey the Word of God, blame the prophet of God, whatever it is, I don't know. But I'm telling you, here's God's great appeal. God's final appeal. It says, here's my son. Will you accept him? My heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let me ask you this. On love's greatest appeal, if you're here today and you have not yet accepted Jesus, the Son of God, if you've not yet opened your heart and opened your arm and opened your mind to him, to his word, and received, if you've not done that, or maybe you have, but you've turned away and you've done something else and you, you've perhaps put your mind on other things for a period of time. You find yourself a long way from where you used to be. If you're here, would you just slip your hand up and just hold it for me right now, would you? Is there anybody? God bless you, sir. Somebody else, find the courage. Say, Pastor, please pray for me. God bless you. Somebody else? That appeal, oh Lord. He's made that appeal. It's up to you. See, what he says is what happened at Calvary. Now the ball is in your court. The ball is in your court. God says, I've given my best. I've given my all. I, what could have been done more that I've not already done? Is there anybody else? I'm going to count to three and then we're going to pray. But I'll wait on you. One. How about you, sir, ma'am, teenager? Two? Anybody? God bless you. Three. I want us to pray right now, would you? Just right where you are, Father, in the name of Jesus. God, you made this tremendous appeal. I can't even imagine <clears throat> the cost when you took your only beloved son and said, I'll send him and they'll reverence him. They'll know where he came from. They'll understand and they'll, they'll do right. But he came and they didn't do right. He came and like others before, beating some and killing some, they did both to him, beat and killed. Then you ask the great question, what shall I, the Lord of the vineyard, do? I know what I'll do. I'll tear down the protection. I'll tear down the tower and the fence. I'll command the clouds not to... Lord, we don't want that in our life. We don't want you to remove your protection. We don't want you to remove your heads from our life. Lord, we don't want you to command the clouds not to bless us with rain. So, Lord, we look to you and Lord, these that raise their hands say, I accept you. I come home to you. Live in my heart, oh Lord. I accept that that you have done in Jesus' name. Can you give the Lord a hand of praise? Wasn't that awesome? My name is Chelsea Sayings, and I hope you guys were just as blessed as I was this morning. Thank you so much, Pastor, for bringing that awesome word. This has been such an incredible time where we can just come together and simply worship. If you decide to take your next step in Christ, we would love to hear from you. 
you have made one of the greatest decisions of your life. If you go to harborwc.com forward slash next steps and fill out your information, one of our staff pastors would love to send you resources on how you can continue your walk in Christ. Also, while you're on our next steps link, you can fill out our connect card where we can send you guys a gift in the mail. And you can also sign up for baptisms, H track, life groups, and prayer. We encourage you to take your next steps today. Also, if you'd love to be a resource of help for our community, we would encourage you to use our text to give. Here you can text any amount to 912-244-8838. This is such a simple way to give. Again, we love you and thank you so much for joining us this morning and we will see you guys again next Sunday at 9 a.m. Bye.